But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this portion of your word. And we're grateful that all scripture is God breathed and that it's profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness. And you tell us in your word that man should not live by bread alone, but rather by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And so we thank you for the living word of God. And we pray that as we look at it this day, that you might open up our eyes to behold the wonderful things that are in your word. And we know that no man or no individual has the ability to do that. And so we cry out to you, Father, and ask that the Spirit of God will remove the blinders from our eyes to see what thus saith you in your precious word. And Father, give us more than just ears to hear, but help us to heed what your blessed word says. So teach us, instruct us, convict us, reprove us as you see fit through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do these vows or oaths sound familiar to you? Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God? What about this one? I blank take you blank to be my wedded wife. And I do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband for richer, for poorer, in plenty and in want in joy and sorrow, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish by the power and for the glory of God as long as we both shall live. This is my solemn vow. Do you remember that, Norlin? Do you remember that, Kevin? Do you remember that, Lawrence? Do you remember that, Matt? <laughs> Solemn vows that I've had a privilege to say to certain men who were getting married. What about this one? Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. You might not remember that, but those of you who became members of Fairview Heights Baptist Church, that is a covenant that you agreed to. And every time I teach the new members class, we go over this church covenant, this agreement, this vow, this solemn vow that we make. Vows and oaths are something common to mankind. But the question might rise, is God concerned about these vows, these promises, these commitments? Does it really matter to him at all? Is it just something that we agree to, something that we say, but really God is indifferent toward? I mean, does it fall into the category of maybe what color socks you might wear? I know I didn't give much thought this morning to the color of the socks that I put on. I just wanted to make sure that it's semi-matched. But I didn't pray. I didn't cry out to God. Because I don't really think God cares about what color socks that I wear. And sometimes when we think about promises, when we think about vows, when we think about oaths, 
we wonder, does our God, the God of heaven and earth, does he stoop down, so to speak, and bother himself with issues like that? And I would tell you that vows and oaths and promises matter to God. James 5 verse 12 makes that clear. That God cares about the words that come out of our mouth. And more importantly, he cares about the heart that's behind the vows and behind the promises. That's what God is really concerned about. He's not just listening to what comes out of our mouth, but he's trying to ascertain, he's trying to determine out of what kind of a heart do these words actually come. As we focus in on just one verse today, James 5, verse 12, I want to approach this verse from the subject, integrity in speech. Integrity in speech. If you've been listening at all to this series on the book of James, the word integrity is not new, it's not unique. In fact, I've shared on numerous occasions that I believe that the theme of the book of James is spiritual wholeness, or to put it another way, spiritual integrity, authentic and genuine salvation. What James is trying to get at with regards to his readers is living a life of integrity. And the verse that probably conveys that the clearest is James chapter 1, verse 4, where James says, Let endurance have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James says when it comes to our speech, God wants us to be perfect or mature. God wants us to be whole or complete. God doesn't want us to be deficient at all when it comes to the matter of words that come out of our mouth. And so I want us to know and to realize that this morning, our God cares about even things like vows and oaths and promises. He's concerned about the commitments that we mouth with words. And as we look at this verse, there's four things that I want you to see. And the first thing is that integrity in speech is a priority in the Christian life. We might not think it's important, but the Word of God, and particularly James, says that integrity, when it comes to the area of our speech, it matters to God. It's important in the Christian life. James, with this one verse, has caused a lot of confusion, so to speak, among Bible interpreters. Because they don't know how this verse fits in with the rest of the book of James. You remember the last thing that we looked at when we studied the book of James is uh, patience in trying times. James was telling us to be patient. How long? Until the coming of the Lord. And he's not just simply telling us how long, but he's reminding us that when we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, it enables us to be patient here on earth. And he told us to look at the farmer. He's an example of patience. But more importantly, he said that if you're going to be patient, then you must be spiritually strong. You've got to be strong. And he talked about the example of Job and the example of the prophets of patience. But now when we come to verse 12, he seems to bring up a subject that doesn't deal with patience. And then when we look at verse 13 and following, James is going to talk about prayer. And so people wonder, James, how does this verse fit in? And I take it that James is giving us a new subject, something that he's trying to draw our attention to, Yes, it's related to being patient, but that's not the focus, and it's not in an introduction to prayer. It's really a subject in and of itself. And so he says, but having concluded talking about patience, I want to talk about verbal integrity. 
I want to talk about those words that, you're, that come out of your mouth. I want to make sure that those words are truthful, that they're accurate, that they're words that can be dependent upon. And so James takes some time to lay this out for us. And he says in introducing these words, above all things. But above all things. He's placing these words basically above everything else. And that's one way to look at it. But I think the better way to look at it is not so much that this is the most important commandment in all the world. Because if it is, Peter uses the same expression and he says that loving one another is to be above all. I think what James is trying to do as he transitions from talking about being patient and then he's going to talk about prayer, he says, let me get your attention. You remember he has different ways to do that. Sometimes he says, behold, look, see. And then other times he says, come now, come now, uh, enter into the dialogue with me. But here he says, above all, as if he wants to get our attention, as if he wants us to realize that these are not just some words to skip over so you can get to the end of the book, but these are words to pay attention to. And when you read commentary, a lot of times they don't even discuss verse 12. They almost act like these words are not important at all. But James is saying they're important, saints. They're important, child of God, above all things. James says, I want you to realize how critical, how important, how significant this issue of integrity in speech is. And so it's an important subject matter. You might not think it's important. You might not pray about your integrity in speech. You might not worry about the promises and the commitments that come out of your mouth. But James says, you should. But above all things, James says, what I'm about to say is a priority. It's important. It's critical. It's crucial. You got to pay attention to it. You have to heed, James says, what I'm about to say. Don't just doze off. Don't just act like, well, I, I like that being patient more. Or I like the idea of praying. No, James says, above all, he's showing the superiority, the, the high place that the words in verse 12 are to have in our life. And I like the fact that he says, but above all things, my brethren. He's been saying some heavy-duty things. I mean, anytime you tell people who are struggling and going through hard times and difficult times to be patient until Jesus comes again, you're not likely to like that message. When he pointed out to them, you're worldly. You adulteresses. You're not likely to like that message. But James is constantly reminding his readers that he's not their enemy. He's not against them. He loves them. He's concerned about them. And so he expresses that concern of a pastor by saying, my brethren, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a loving concern. It's a personal concern. It's a pastoral concern. And, and you need to understand that when strong words come out of a pastor's mouth, that doesn't mean that he doesn't love you, that he doesn't care about you, but rather it really shows how deep the love and the affection is. James is saying, I'm not just somebody on a soapbox blasting out words. But this is coming from your brother. This is coming from one who sees you as brother and sister in Christ. We're part of the same family of God. So he's saying, but above all things, 
my brother. But he's stressing, he's emphasizing how important, how critical integrity in speech actually is. But the second thing that I would want you to see from our text is that James 5.12 also reveals that integrity in speech heeds the prohibition on using oaths. This text shows that when I'm involved in integrity in speech, what I'm doing, if I'm obeying God's word, I'm heeding the prohibition on the use of oaths and vows. When you come to the middle part of verse, five, verse 12, James basically issues two commands, a negative command and a positive command. But before he gets to the positive command, he gives the negative command. And, and the negative command consists of a prohibition, something that we are not to do, something that we are forbidden to do. And, and what is that prohibition? James says in verse 12, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Did you get the prohibition? Do not swear. And I know what's coming into your mind. Don't cuss. Don't use foul language. Don't use filthy language. But James, that's the furthest thought in his mind. He's not thinking about that. Now, I hope you understand that you shouldn't be cussing. You shouldn't be cursing. You shouldn't be using foul language and filthy language and dirty language. Now, if you don't understand that, just read Paul's word in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, 29, and verse 30, where he says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that which edifies and builds up and he even points out to us that when we use bad language, that it grieves the spirit of God. If that's not enough, sex language, dirty language, unclean language is also mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. Paul says that kind of talk is not appropriate for the people of God. But when James prohibits swearing, he's not talking about cursing or cussing. He's talking about making oaths. He's talking about taking the stand, so to speak, to guarantee that what's coming out of your mouth is reality, is